Hello everybody, welcome back to Read and Reread. I am Angelia. If you are new here, I'm so glad you have joined me. And today is time for Friday Reads on May the, as usual, I don't know what. Hold on. May the 26th. I'm filming this on Thursday, so I don't know if I've gotten as far as I usually get in my reading, but my daughter's coming tomorrow and I need to cap proof the house in the morning when I would usually do my video, so I'm doing it today on Thursday. Looking forward to a fun family weekend. All right, let's get started. So first of all, in the television viewing, we finally finished The Wire. We were re-watching the entire series, The Wire, and has five seasons, and we finished it. And this was back before shows got skimpy and did seasons that had six episodes. And so all the, all the seasons had at least 10, 10 to 12, and it was really good all over again. There were a few things that dated it, but the basic core of how good the story is and the characters and the actors, every single person is so good in this show. And, but you know, the, I talked a little bit last week about how watching it back to back, it, it made it heavier. And really you get to the end and the overall theme is pretty cynical and depressing. There's, it ends with a lot of things have cycled around to where a different character has sort of taken the part of a previous character. And they examine several dysfunctional institutions and none of them really um, are improved or the the, uh, the system, systemic problems aren't really corrected. But anyway, I think that's kind of the point. But it was really, really good. Um, I think it's still probably overall the best show that I have watched although I had there's some other you know contenders for the prize or the runners-up so then we started watching Silo and that is a science fiction show on Apple TV and it is based on this trilogy of books I'll put a picture up here by Hugh Howley and the first book in the series is Wool Stephen and I read this series a few years ago and we both liked it so we wanted to see uh, how Apple put this together and we I think we've seen three episodes so far and I would say right now that the the visual the way that the silo looks is really dazzling it looks beautiful and the plot is intriguing the characters and the acting it has not really caught on for me yet so we'll see how it goes the, the basic premise is that uh, people, society lives inside this gigantic silo and it has all of these uh, levels and like in many science fiction stories, there, the social stratification exists where the upper levels are the more educated, um, I don't know, specialized, it, it's brighter and lighter and everything. And then it gets darker as you go down and the engineers and, and the people who keep the infrastructure working work down lower and it uh, nobody goes outside if you what they believe and nobody remembers any before time that if you go outside the air is poison and you'll die and that in the past the silo was built to save society and there's a finite number of people who can live here so you have to apply for permission to have a child and um, if somebody said no, like the the biggest transgression in their um their code or their laws is to say you want to go outside if you say that they put you in a suit and they send you out through the airlock and after, and everybody can see you through this big window and you can clean the window with your steel wool if you want to to help out the people inside which is where the title wool comes from and then after a few minutes everybody sees you keel over on this hill and you die so that's where it starts and uh, I'll let you know what happens. And so what am I reading? Well, the first thing to talk about, unfortunately, is a DNF. I read about half of Scatterlings, this South African novel by Re Rezoketswa Manansi, and then I bailed. The, the idea for the story sounded interesting to me. There's a couple, it's in the 1920s, a couple in South Africa. The, the wife is black, she's from Jamaica. The husband is white and they have two daughters. And then all of a sudden the law is passed, um, basically making their union illegal 
and their children illegal. And the mother is mentally ill. I'm uh, not sure what her illness is. She seemed perhaps depression, but she she's not stable. And she panics when she hears this news and does something very desperate. And so then there's the immediate aftermath where the father uh, realizes that it's not safe to be here and he needs to to he needs to leave and with his daughter. And so it that sounds pretty good, but the problem was the style of the writing. It was very I finally figured out what the problem was. It's very ponderous. It it has this very stilted and ponderous style and the dialogue also and so the people sound they don't sound like they're in the 20th century. And then also several times just in the amount of ground I covered, people do this thing that drives me insane in books where somebody, usually a child, asks an adult a question and instead of answering the question, they launch into a long-winded folktale. And folktale jags that don't really that are murky and don't advance the plot that I guess I cannot stand that it drives me crazy it's like can we just talk talk have a conversation character development don't I don't want to hear about this story that your grandmother told and I'm supposed to extract something out of it now I'm not I mean I'm not entirely sometimes there's a relevance to well the story my grandmother told if, if something follows up but if that's the entire scene and then the kid is just left empty-handed I, I don't know I feel like that comes up kind of not maybe not enough to be an actual trope but that just drives me nuts all the the dreamy drifty folk taley jags and the ponderous writing and so I just I could not find purchase in this story and and I gave up but then then I segued into something much more delightful and that was The Peacock by Isabel Bogdan. I talked about this one in my last haul video. It is a book, it, this is kind of interesting. The author Isabel Bogdan is German and the book was translated into English by Annie Rutherford. The book is entirely set in Scotland. It's about a group of British um, bankers from London who go on a team building retreat at this Scottish estate that rents out its cottages for family vacations and corporate events such as this. And I thought a thing that I thought was unusual was that when I looked up the information inside about Bogdan, it says that she she's German, but she studied English and Japanese, and she is a translator of books from English to German. She has translated books by Jane Gardam, Jonathan Saffron Foer, Foer, uh, Nick Hornby, and Jasper Ford. So, which leads me to wonder why she didn't just write her book uh, herself, why, or translate it herself. It seems like if she, I, I don't get it. Why did she need a translator? But I don't really understand the art of translation, so maybe if you know why she would use a different translator when she is a translator and is um, fluent in German and, and English. I don't know. So, but whatever. It's a very fun book. It's light. It's funny. If you are looking as I am to have a little short list of lighter material that sometimes you just need something like that to intersperse into your reading, either because of the headspace you're in or because you have read a string of heavy material and not, you just need something not so taxing. And this is the book for you. Um, so this is just really delightful. So what we have here, this, so this group of bankers goes to this Scottish estate and the estate is run by a lord and lady, but they are contemporary. The woman is an engineer, the husband is a professor at a nearby university, and then they run this estate with their main house and all these cottages. And they're doing okay, they're not broke, but they never really have enough money to renovate them or bring them up to code. So it's a constant kind of DIY band-aid of all these things that go wrong. So the heating barely works. The plumbing barely works. It's it's pretty rustic. The Wi-Fi only works in the main house. So it it's just kind of, it's sort of a marginal experience. 
um, if you don't like uh, rural settings. And so this group goes out there and if you have ever suffered through team building exercises, you will recognize the, the situation of this group faces. So there's four men that are bankers and their boss, who is a woman named Liz, and they bring along the psychologist who's supposed to lead the team building exercise. She's a last minute replacement because Liz booked this with someone she went to school with and he uh, claimed illness at the last minute and foisted it onto Rachel. And they also brought along a cook, which that, that might have changed my feelings about team building exercises. If there had been a person that brought along who was constantly rolling out baked goods and tea and meals at the appropriate intervals, that, that might have made all the difference. You probably will also recognize some of the personality types that are in this group. There is the, the boss who does not know that she's difficult. You have the, the suck up guy who just wants to please her and get in her good graces all the time and irritates everyone else. Uh, there is the guy who thinks this is stupid and, uh, and beneath them and unprofessional and why are we out here? And what do you mean there's no Wi-Fi? There is the unflappable, uh, unbothered dude who has no problems with anything and whatever ridiculous thing happens, he's just kind of like, huh, yeah, that reminds me of this time, you know, da 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 da. And, and then there is the, uh, the young guy, the new guy who doesn't quite have his footing, doesn't know w what his role is, doesn't want to mess up, just, you know, he, he's, he's just kind of observing and trying to figure out where he fits into the situation. So, um, it is called the peacock. And let me just tell you, the plumage does enter into it. And something happens early on in the book regarding a, a deranged peacock who violently attacks anything that is the color blue. And I, what happens, all the things that happen regarding this peacock, I probably should not find funny as a vegetarian, but I'm also, you know, kind of warped. So I did find it funny. And... It was kind of one of those series of um, misunderstandings and lies and cover-ups that, that snowball, literally, because a snowstorm comes into the story too, but uh, kind of like an episode of Frasier or something where these two people know something and these two people know something, but they think they're talking about something else. And it just, you know, it just keeps going. You don't know if everyone's going to be exposed or they're all going to get away with their secrets and it, it's very funny. Um, it's not very long. It's it's just kind of a romp. It was just very refreshing. And I realized, I don't know when I last read a book that was light and funny. Um, I, I just can't even think. I've read lots of books that have humor in them, but the book itself overall was more serious. But this was not serious. It was not strenuous. It was just fun. I really liked it. And I did have to look up some Scottish things that were talked about in this book. Uh, they talked about the, the holiday uh, Hogmanay, which is a three-day kind of throwdown for New Year's. It sounds like fun. Also, uh, one of the characters is always drinking something that I found out is pronounced Iron Brew, but it looks like Urn Brew. I'll put it up on the screen. And could somebody who's ever had this please explain this what I got got from looking it up is that it is a carbonated beverage, and no one seems to know what it tastes like. I heard that it tasted like sweetened listerine. Gross. I heard it tasted like uh, sparkling bubble gum, and then I heard that it tasted like orange and black currant, and that it was indeed bright orange. And that made me think of brass monkey, that funky monkey. So somebody please explain uh, the Iron Brew, but um, it was really a fun book. All right, so here's a little uh, digression that I'll probably cut out if this video is way too long, but the, uh, the, the Brass Monkey made me think of the time that I did not see the Beastie Boys. So if you know, they have the song Brass Monkey. And so this is uh, early, mid 80s. And a group, in, a group that I was in, we were going, we lived in Northern Virginia, and we were going up to D.C. 
to see Public Image Limited and the Beastie Boys were opening. It was right before they hit it big. So they, they weren't an opening act for very long. They became headliners. But so we, but we, were, we wanted to see Public Image Limited and the Beastie Boys were like, yeah, okay, whatever. So we, we pile up. It's like a um, 50 minute drive uh, from where we live up, up to where we're going. And so we stop at this uh, truck stop gas station in our, we lived in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So we stopped there and got the gas. So we're, we're on the little ramp. We're gonna go back up to the highway and this gigantic semi truck is in front of us. All of a sudden, for unknown reasons, the truck starts to back up and we're in this little car and there's a whole bunch, we're all packed in there and the truck's backing up and the guy uh, driving was named, is named Mike, of course, because this is an 80s story with people that are now in their 50s. So there has to be someone named Mike in the group, right? So Mike is, he's like screaming, everybody's screaming, he's hitting the horn, but they can't see us or hear us because we're down low and the truck's up high. So it backs up, it starts smooshing us like an accordion and we can't go backward because there's a car behind us. So everybody's screaming. Finally, it stops. Mike gets out and goes charging up there and he's this great big dude with a mohawk and he goes running up there and he's screaming at this guy. And then there's like a blank piece. I can't remember. I mean, nobody died, or I'd remember that, but somehow I can't remember how the altercation <laughs> ensued. But I remember we had to drive back to Mike's house with this smoking, squashed accordion car and blah, 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 back to his house. And we're running late. Now we're, now we're freaking out because we're late. And he goes, this was before his cell phone. So Mike goes running into the house. Dad, we had a wreck. I need your car. Can't tell you later. Bye. And he and he just gets his dad's keys and he comes back out. We all get in this other car and we leave. And his dad's just left with this smoking wrecked Hulk in front of the house. And we did make it to the place in time for Public Image Limited, but we missed the Beastie Boys. And that is the story of how I did not see the Beastie Boys, but I still don't know what Iron Brew tastes like. Thank you. There's also two books that I am in the middle of. I picked up The Hobbit, so I guess that my happy cozy reading streak is continuing and I am reading The Hobbit, rereading The Hobbit, and it's going pretty fast and I'm just uh, loving it once again. Um, I've already gotten past uh, the Gollum part and the Eagle part and now we're at the shapeshifter bear dude part. So that's where I am in the book and I'll talk more about it when I get to the end, but I'm really loving this reread of The Hobbit. And if you have never read it, it it's, I, I highly recommend it. it. It's really good fantasy book for people who don't read a lot of fantasy, which is kind of who I am. Um, but I've enjoyed it many a time since I was a kid. I think the last time I read it was when my daughter was uh, I don't even know, like late elementary school and we read it together, read it out loud for family reading time. And then she had to read it in middle school and she had already read it. So she kind of was able to cruise right through it. Uh, but I think that's the last time that I reread the book. Um, so I'm happy to read it again. And finally, I am still reading How the Word is Passed by Clint Smith. And as you can see, there are lots of things. These are not all things that I'm going to share with you, but some of it are just uh, places that I want to come back to and reread and reflect on before I finish reading the book. But um, so in this book, he he Clint Smith visits several places that are um, important in the history of American slavery, and he's looking at several things. He's looking at the history itself. He's looking at the perception of the history, or the misperceptions of it, or the lost aspects of it. He's considering its impact on him as a black man living in today's America and presenting to us what we all should be considering and thinking about and extra uh, things that we should know. So I'm really enjoying getting a lot of extra illumination and holes filled in my knowledge of American slavery, its institution and also uh, ha the ramifications today. Something else that's a real bonus about this book is that Clint Smith is also a poet and this shines through in his writing style. So the book is never dry or boring, even when he has sections that are straight up research. His style is wonderful. 
and I marked a passage that, as an example to share with you. And let me find it. This is when he is visiting Blandford Cemetery in Petersburg, Virginia. He is noticing some dragonflies that have fluttered in, and here is how he describes it. Two Confederate flags sat at the bottom of the columns, framing the main archway and flapped gently in the wind. The first dragonflies of spring whipped through the light breeze, their translucent wings pulsing against the warm air, their unbridled bodies somersaulting past one another. I watched them dance through the air, land atop a headstone, and pause. I watched their wings twitch once, twice, then take off again, their bodies governed by the wind. I watched and, somewhat mystically, wondered whether these might have been descendants of the dragonflies that flew over this land during the war, more than a century and a half ago. I imagined them zipping past the bullets that turned men into ghosts, their wings warm with beads of blood. I imagined them landing on top of bodies that were strewn on top of bodies, circling the smoke billowing from burning soil. So this book is... It's intriguing, it's fascinating, and it's also just a lovely reading experience. And so I'm enjoying it and I will have more to say about it as I continue on with it. Okay, let me see. Um, I check my cheat sheet here. I think that I talked about all the books that I have been reading in this slightly shortened week and uh, upcoming videos. The end of the month is nigh and so I will be doing a June TBR with all of my uh, possibilities for Pride Month and other personal projects, uh, May wrap up, and also the, the often mentioned and finally will be delivered video about my booktube prize judging. So I think that the 30th is the deadline for people to vote, and then after that they will reveal uh, which books made it through, and then we can we can put up our reaction videos. So. I'm looking forward to all of that. I hope that you have a wonderful weekend if you're celebrating the, if you're getting the long weekend in the States for Memorial Day, have a good time. I'm really glad that my daughter is getting an extra day off so she could come and spend time with mom and pop and have a great time, everybody. See you soon. Bye.